for today's uh, lecture on quantum computing. And it's a distinct pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Dennis Wilsch. Dennis is postdoctoral researcher at the Ulich Supercomputer Center in Germany at the Quantum Information Processing Group. He has obtained PhD in physics in 2020 for the work simulating the time evolution of transmon quantum computers. And Dennis, we're looking forward to your today's talk on applications of quantum vanillas. The stage is yours. Yeah, hello everybody and welcome to this talk. Um, my name is Dennis Wilsch, the Vlad already introduced me. And the title of this talk is Applications on Quantum Vanillas at JSC. And I'll give an overview of all the applications uh, that we've studied in the recent past on quantum vanillas. Okay, here are the contents. So first I'll give a short overview of what quantum vanillas actually are, what they look like and what problems they solve. And then I'll discuss four particular applications. And um, here are my group members. And um, so those are my group members who all contributed to some parts of these applications. All right, so what do quantum vanillas look like? Here's an image of the previous quantum vanilla by D-Wave, the 2000Q. Um, in the meantime, there is a newer 5,000 quantum, 5,000 qubit quantum vanilla uh, that we've studied most of the applications on which I'm going to present. But inside, they all have this large dilution refrigerator. Uh, this is meant to cool down the processor at the very bottom to a temperature of uh, roughly minus, uh, minus 273 degrees Celsius. So superconducting systems are rather cold. And these processors are actually rather small. So they look like this. And on them, we have those superconducting loops here, which then implement the qubits. So schematically, these qubits, these qubits are always uh, visualized as these arrows here. Um, they are like spin systems. So you can imagine they're small magnetic fields uh, that evolve according to the rules of quantum mechanics. And um, for this talk, most importantly, uh, we have this schematic representation of which qubit is connected to which other qubit. This particular graph is the chimera graph. That's the topology in this 2000 qubit quantum vanilla. So here's the progress of quantum vanillas over the past years, uh, decades actually. And um, as we see here, D-Wave has roughly managed to double their processors every two years. So um, this seems to be a scalable architecture. And the most recent processor is this 5,760 qubit processor called D-Wave Advantage. So what's the problem that these quantum vanillas actually solve? This is a, a cubo problem, and, and this is probably the most important formula of this talk. So we'll discuss it in a bit more detail. So a cubo problem is a quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem. And, oh, sorry. And um, binary in this uh, acronym means that the problem variables are binary. So these are these xi, they are all represented by one qubit within this uh, huge processor or within this huge machine. And the problem itself is controllable by these biases. These are real numbers that we as programmers have to control and also those couplers. Uh, and also these we can control. So basically, the only thing that this machine does is solve this minimization problem. And as a programmer, we have to choose these linear coefficients and these quadratic coefficients here. So this is only a single problem. So why might this be interesting? Uh, one reason is that discrete optimization is a hard problem, right? Because for discrete optimization, you would basically need to try all of the possible combinations of zeros and ones to find the minimum of this function. Um, these quantum vanillas, and that's a scheme that all quantum computers actually have, they produce many solutions, so-called shots or reads simultaneously. So um, simultaneously, at least from the user perspective. That is, when I submit such a problem to the machine, I get typically 1,000 samples that might not all be the global minimum. Some of them might have a higher energy, but I get all of them simultaneously. And um, sometimes also an ensemble of several low energy solutions. Uh, might be very helpful for applications. The third reason is it has a very low energy consumption. The reason for this is the superconductivity. So the currents in these processors basically don't waste any energy. Of course, we have the cooling system, but um, this is much less compared to what. So I work in a supercomputing center, and we typically have um, energy consumption of megawatts. And this uh, 
system is, is rather low energy. So we are in the kilowatt regime. Okay, so qubit connectivity is an important problem because as I said, as programmers, we can choose these couplers, but not all of these couplers also exist on the machine. So for example, let's see, let's say I have a problem graph that looks like this, uh, where I can control these biases and then between the qubits, these coupling coefficients, but maybe there are no triangles on the topology of the chip. And what we'll do then, we'll see in the first application later on. Uh, few specifications of the system. So the D-Wave 2000Q, the older system with 2000 qubits and the newer system advantage with 5000 qubits, they have 6000 or 35,000 couplers respectively. Uh, and the connectivity has increased from here to here um, by nine which we can see when we visualize the topology of these systems in these graphs. So this is the Chimera architecture where each qubit is coupled to six other qubits. And this is the newer topology of the Pegasus system where each qubit is coupled to, uh, at least most of them are coupled to 15 other qubits. Uh, and in a sense, of course, this limits the size and the problems that these uh, ships can solve. But there is a way around, given that, for example, we have this triangle, which we could not natively fit on this graph, there are ways around this. And this is a very important concept called embedding. And we will see what this means in the first application. Um, but before we go there, um, so these are the only two physics slides, um, sort of the bare minimum, what I need to introduce. And um, here we have uh, that all these systems are described by a Hamiltonian. Um, that is one concept that we use in quantum theory to describe these systems. And these quantum annealers, they evolve in time. So they start with a particular Hamiltonian at the beginning and evolve into a final Hamiltonian. And during this time evolution, it takes a few microseconds, they solve the problem. So these functions in front of these Hamiltonians, as I said, this one is at the very beginning, is very high. They go down to zero at the end. And the other function starts from zero and goes to a rather high number so that in the end, the system is described by this Hamiltonian. So this is really a change in the system. This is how they physically work. So at the beginning, the system is in the initial Hamiltonian. And in the end, it's in a ground in a state of the final Hamiltonian. And I've tried to mark this with a different color here. And this evolution in time is important to know about because the time that it takes for the system to solve a problem, even though it's like, like a few microseconds, is it can be very significant. Uh, this is the annealing time. And as a programmer, we have some control over the annealing time. If it's uh, sufficiently slowly, like um, if it's 1,000 or 2,000 microseconds maximum we can choose, we have a high chance of finding the solution. But if it's too fast, um, the solution may not be optimal. However, they can also be too large given that these systems interact with the environment, and then we also have to care about. So these are some things that we need to know about if, uh, if we try to solve a problem and it doesn't work. And then in the final Hamiltonian, a measurement of the system yields the solution to the problem, to the optimization problem that we want to solve. So this is what was called adiabatic quantum computation. And now um, the final physics slide, what are these Hamiltonians actually? And for this, we have to reformulate our problem a bit. Namely, there's not only the Kubel formulation that we had before shown up here, but there's also the easing formulation where the problem variables are minus or plus one. And to convert from the problem that is easy to specify, we just replace each binary variable by these spin variables or these easing variables and collect all the linear and quadratic terms. Of course, the coefficients have changed now, but you can see that the optimization problem itself is equivalent. And the Hamiltonian is, so this function is important because this is exactly the final Hamiltonian that the system evolves into. So when we start in some lowest energy state, we evolve through what is the quantum annealing schedule into the lowest energy state of the final Hamiltonian, which is then the solution to this problem. And then also, of course, the solution to our initial problem. Okay, so now let's get to programming. Is it actually difficult to program quantum needles? And for this, I always like to show uh, some results that three schoolboys from Regensburg scored uh, under our guidance. Um, they solved uh, in 2019 the N Queens problem for eight queens on the D Wave 2000 cube. So the N Queens problem is the problem of placing eight queens on an eight by eight chessboard for N equals eight so that no queen attacks another queen. And they scored the first prize in Jugendforscht for this. 
And here is a snippet of what actually is necessary to program the annealers. Uh, of course, everything is Python nowadays. So you specify the A's and the B's, so the biases and the coupler in some Python code and uh, combine it in a dictionary and pass it to the D-Wave library along with a number of solutions that you want to have. So that's what I meant with as a programmer, we see all of these simul uh, solutions simultaneously. Okay, let's look at the first application. So this is vegetable garden optimization. Um, it's a very recent application that you can find more about in this paper here. And the story is the following. We have a few nice vegetables and our farmer wants to know how to get these nice vegetables on his field. Um, he has knowledge of certain vegetables that like each other and other stone. For example, tomato and cucumber should not be placed next to each other while tomato and lettuce uh, support each other so they can grow well if they are placed next to each other. And he has a huge list of all these vegetables. And the problem is now known as companion planting in polyculture vegetable gardens. And the task is to find an optimal placement of all these plants given a certain arrangement of pots in the garden considering the characteristics of their nearest neighbor so that many of the plants like each other. And to solve this problem on a quantum annealer, we need to find a Kubo formulation of this problem. So a formulation in this form. Um, first, we assign what each qubit should represent. And this is, of course, a choice. And we found that uh, this choice here works very well. So we have a qubit uh, set to 1, meaning that a species of type J, that can be tomato or cucumber, is placed in pot I. And if the qubit is zero, then we say the species is not placed in pot I. Of course, there are other choices, but this worked well enough. And you see that this qubit now has two indices, while in the Kubo formulation has only one index. But uh, we can, of course, map the two-dimensional index to one-dimensional index by linearization. OK, so uh, the optimization objective is that all plants should have a good relationship with their neighbors so that we can have a happy gardening, a happy, happy harvest. And we express this mathematically in this term. So we sum over all the pots. And if J is the connectivity of the pots, the positions in the garden, if pot I and pot I prime are neighbors, then this is 1, otherwise it's 0. And if it's 1, we sum over this cost. And here enters the matrix of all the vegetables. So this cost here is uh, minus 1 if species j and species j prime like each other. If this is minus one, we get a zero here, so a zero contribution. Um, it's The cost is zero if they are, they are neutral. This would be a slightly positive contribution to the energy. And if they don't like each other, it's one, so a very positive contribution, so that only with a minimum we find a, an arrangement of plants that works very well. Then there are certain other constraints. And this is how we, use, how we encode constraints. And Cubo means unconstrained, but there is a way of adding constraints to the problem. And in this case, we have the constraint that all available plants and pots should be used. And this works by, uh, by writing down an inequality. One equals the sum, for example. This would be for each pot i, there should only be one species in this pot. And then we take the difference of both sides of the equality square it so that only if the difference is zero, we have a zero contribution, otherwise a positive contribution, and add this to the cost function. And the same scheme we use for this constraint that says that for each species, if we sum over the pots, the pots i, the result should be the number of species that we have available that we want to plant. So if we want to plant three tomatoes, this would be three. And if we sum over all the pots, then there should only be the three tomatoes in total. There is a third constraint that we just included for convenience, that big plants should not shadow small ones. And this we can mathematically express like this. And uh, if we put that all together, we, we see that this is a quadratic assignment problem with constraints. Um, but for our purpose, where we want to benchmark the quantum annealers, it's important that this is a flexible problem, that it has a flexible size, and it needs an embedding. And this is what I alluded to in the beginning. Uh, what does embedding mean? So if we have a problem where we have certain connections that we cannot find directly on the chip, 
then principally we have a problem. And we solve this by introducing qubit chains. So here we have, for example, three variables that have a coupling in our cubo. We want to embed it on part of the chimera architecture where there are no triangles. Then we can use for the red qubit here, for example, the qubit chain of two qubits. And if we map one problem variable to several qubits, we must, of course, somehow achieve that this chain behaves as a single unit. And we do this by setting a very strong negative coupling between these two qubits on the chip. And mathematically, this looks like this. If we go from our cubo formulation uh, over to the icing formulation, so the D-Wave software does this automatically because uh, on the chip, it's all specified in terms of the easing model with um, magnetic fields H and, and couplings J. Then after we've achieved this formulation, we see here a coupling. This is the physical coupling on the chip. And if this is very strong and negative, we ensure that those two spins or those two qubits are aligned. So if this one is, has the same sign, so they are plus minus one, right? This one has the same sign as this one, uh, and this is negative, then we go down in energy. And if this large enough, then we go down uh, very much. Of course, we have to see that we don't, don't go down too much because otherwise we might distort our problem. And exactly how much we go down is specified by this chain strength here. So this is a parameter that as a programmer, we have to choose carefully. And D-Wave offers tools for doing the embedding and given a chain strength for also doing going through all this process. So in principle, you only need to give this to the Python code and a chain strength to make the embedding work. However, if you see that results are not uh, results don't look good, then um, you can look at the embedding. And usually, in our experience, if the embedding has chains like one problem variable, several qubits, and these chains have more than seven qubits, then there might be problems. Um, in theory, there exist embeddings for fully connected problems with these chains. So, fully connected problems are the most difficult problems in principle. And in graph theory, they're called cliques. And um, we call these problem variables then logical qubits. And we can embed fully connected problems with 64 logical qubits on the old system with chains of length 17. So by our guidance, this would, of course, or might not work well, of course, there might be exceptions. But on the new chip, we can embed a 64 uh, prob a qubit of 64 variable problem, which is fully connected with chains of length 7. So uh, this is what the improved connectivity at least um, suggests. OK, so let's look at a few results. So here we see garden problems with several variables uh, from 16 variables. The number of variables, by the way, is the number of pots times the number of plants. So this would be a 4 by 4 problem, for example. But uh, we scaled this problem up to 100 variables. And the different colors show the different systems. So important are the blue line and the green line. Blue line's the old system, green line's the new system. And we plot the success rate as a function of the chain strength. So the uh, chain strength is uh, what I said, what we as programmers have to choose. And it's uh, often very helpful to use a relative chain strength where we choose this number uh, set by the scale of the AIs and BIJs because they set the scale of the problem, right? And then typically we see such a curve that uh, for relative chain strength between 0 0.5 and 1, we have an optimum so that the embeddings, so this is averaged over several embedding, uh, several embeddings yields good results. And in particular, you see for the large problem with 100 variables, only the new system, the advantage system, was able to solve the problem. Um, then there is one thing which I, I think I need to mention. Uh, we personally don't use this very much because we try to benchmark the bare physical a quantum processor, but for applications, uh, D-Wave also offers hybrid solvers, and they are capable of um, solving much uh, larger problems. Um, they do this by automatically subdividing the problems into uh, smaller subproblems, some of which are then solved on the QPU and using classical post-processing or some classical solver in addition to this. They try to find the best possible solution to this Kubo. So it's really easy to use these hybrid solvers, um, and they're also very good. So you, you really get very quite good solutions nowadays for, for a cubo. 
but you don't know, and that's in a, from my point of view, the, the disadvantage, how much of your problem was actually solved on the quantum processor. Okay, but uh, of course, we also benchmark these services, and here are some results for this. Um, so we can go onto problems of uh, 12,000 variables, which is much larger than the 100 variable problem we could solve on the bare QPU. Um, we might have we might have been able to go a bit faster if we uh, farther if we had subdivided the problems ourselves. But um, this this was not the point of this exercise, and the hybrid solvers do this for us. So we have uh, QB solve we took as a classical um, uh, opponent to the hybrid solvers and taboo sampler another classical algorithm. And uh, we compared the, the hybrid services version one using the old D-Wave system and version two using the new D-Wave system against these uh, rather good classical solvers. And we see that um, we use now the energy as a measure for success because these problems are so large that we don't know the optimum uh, beforehand. So we can only use the energy to judge if a solution is very good or not. And um, here we see that the hybrid sol solver version two can indeed solve all these problems, although the QB solve might have a higher success rate here. However, the QB solve takes more than a factor of 100 longer to, to deliver these problems. So these uh, quantum computers are also very fast uh, in, in delivering the solutions. It takes a few microseconds to get a solution for a given cubo. And um, in that way, we might we think that the hybrid solver did a better job here because uh, computing time matters, of course. And uh, the second thing, the taboo sampler, which was very quick, did not yield any good solutions at all. So in this case, we found that the hybrid solvers do outperform our best classical um, opponents. Uh, all right, um, let's go to the second application. This is called the tail assignment problem. And tail assignment is the problem of airline scheduling. It's called tail assignment because each airplane has a tail, a number on its tail. And uh, this is why in, in the jargon, an airplane is called a tail. So we want to find an assignment of airplanes to a certain number of flights, a certain number of routes that are given. And the constraint is that, uh, or the task is that we want to find the optimal flight schedule such that each flight of all the flights that we need to do is covered exactly once. So in the name, you can already see there might be some exact cover problem uh, hidden in here, and this is indeed the case. So we are given this exact cover matrix uh, where each column is a certain represents a certain flight from some airport to another airport, and the rows are a certain uh, potential pre-selected routes that uh, the airplanes can fly. And now we need to select certain set of routes such that each flight is covered exactly once. And the mathematical formulation of this problem looks like this. It's basically a linear assignment problem where we minimize a certain objective function. And this objective function encodes the cost of assigning airplanes to routes. So here we have airport curfews and fuel costs, et cetera. Some things which, um, where, where we might have some room, but uh, the important thing here is the constraint given by the exact cover problem that each flight is covered exactly once. So here there's no room, right? Because um, two airplanes cannot fly the same flight or they would collide or anything. So the exact cover part is, is the most important part of this problem. And we represented this whole problem as an Ising model. And, and this is um, a choice, right? We could have gone with the Kubo model, but now we went with an Ising formulation and we start like this. So as before, we have the objective function, uh, what we want to minimize, the cost here with some coefficient. And we add the constraint by taking the difference of both sides. Uh, the matrix A, by the way, is exactly this matrix here. We take the difference and we square it. And this is the minimization problem that we have to solve. And now if we multiply that out, we would directly obtain a quadratic problem that we could put on uh, the chip. So the axes are already binary variables that tell us if a certain route is selected or not. But uh, we went through the transformation to the easing model by using this formula. And then we obtained such a formulation. And um, we did this so that we could have a distribution of the magnetic fields H and of the couplings that uh, have to be set on the chip. And these distributions look like this. 
So um, this is uh, rather peaked at the center and the couplings much less in energy are peaked uh, at low couplings. And this matters because uh, when things are put on the chip, they have to be rescaled because there is only a certain range of magnetic fields that can be realized on the chip. And we wanted to see what effect this has. And um, this uh, then amounts to uh, 25 to 40 qubit problems. And the characteristic is that these final um, problems are all almost fully connected. So uh, for 40 qubits, we already might expect some difficulties. So uh, as a graph, we see the connectivity of a 40 qubit problem here. And because uh, 40 qubit problems that are almost all connected for sure uh, need an embedding to be put on the chip. So um, here are some results. For all of these uh, 30 to 40 qubit problems, uh, so I skipped the 25 qubit problems uh, because they are rather simple. Um, we try 10 different embeddings. So we simply use um, the software provided by D-Wave to generate embeddings. And we specify different chain strings to see if we see the same characteristics that we saw for the garden problem. And the goal here was to benchmark the old system with a Chimera architecture versus the new system. So um, I'm showing results now for uh, three particular problems here, but um, the results were rather uh, represent so they are representative of all the results and again we see the same shape of the curve so we plot the relative chain strength now between zero and one versus the success rate so the number of solutions that we obtain that solve the problem and for 40 qubits we see that the old uh, system struggled so only few embeddings um, you could could you rather uh, low success rates and on the Pegasus, or on the advantage system with the Pegasus topology, this was much better. So um, here we see a clear improvement in the technology from the old to the new system. Um, we also tried larger problems with uh, up to 120 logical qubits. Um, and they could also be embedded on the systems because in this case, they had a sparser connectivity. So only 20% of the couplers were non-zero. And again, here we compare the old and the new system. And we plot here for the different qubits, for the pr different problem sizes from 50 to 120 qubits, the success rate. And then, because these are larger problems, also the time that it took to solve these problems. Because time is, of course, also important because you're accounted for the time that you use the systems. And we make the following of the observations. Um, the new system is capable of solving larger problems. So the 120 qubit problems, logical qubits, uh, could not be solved on the old system anymore. So we see only blue symbols here. Then advantage solved the problems faster. So roughly a factor of two faster uh, compared to the old system. But, and then this is one limitation that we noticed that if the old system can solve a problem, so for the uh, problems which are smaller, then the success rate is sometimes higher. So for the 50 and 60 qubit problems, we have success rates of almost one, whereas on the Pegasus system on, uh, on the DWF Advantage, we also found smaller success rate. But in principle, the success rate is not so important because uh, typically you get a thousand solutions at the same time. And if some of them solve your problem, in principle, you are done, right? But okay, this is a trend that we could observe here. All right. Let's go to the third application. This is called two satisfiability. So two set problems are um, very well-known problems in computer science, and they are mathematically formulated like this. So we have a Boolean expression that is a conjunction of many clauses. And each of these clauses has two variables. That's why it's called two satisfiability. And each of these uh, variables can either be x or not x. x then would be the problem variable that later maps to the qubit. And the task is to find an assignment to all these xi that makes this Boolean expression true. Um, then we need to reformulate this as a Kubo or an easing problem. And also here we chose the easing formulation. And we started with an energy function that looks like this. So we noticed that uh, for such a satisfiability problem, 
it can only be true if each of the clauses is true separately. So we need to formulate the function as a sum of separate functions for each of these clause. And these uh, functions have to be such that they are zero or have a minimum, but in this case zero, only if these clauses are true and have a positive contribution if they are not true. So only the all zero solution would be a solution to the original problem. And um, these clauses then can be found in a table or we can find them by experimenting. But for example, uh, this clause x1 logical or x2 would be represented by such a term. So uh, the Boolean value zero maps to the spin minus one or the S value minus one and Boolean one maps to plus one. And uh, if you calculate that through, um, whenever this is true, this expression yields a zero. But in this case where this is false, so if both x's are zero, so both s's are minus one, then we have uh, minus one and minus, or actually we should have four. Yes, right. We have minus one times minus one and uh, two plus ones here and here. So this is four and this is not zero. And um, the problems that we chose uh, in this case have 18 variables with uh, 19 clauses. And we call these problems hard two sub problems. Uh, hard because their purpose is to benchmark quantum annealers. Um, as, as you might know, two sub problems, of course, are not hard for uh, digital computers. Um, they can, in fact, be solved in polynomial time. But we engineered these problems to be very hard to solve on the quantum annealer so that we can find the solution easily on a digital computer and then see if the quantum annealer can also make uh, a good, good job on these problems that are hard for the quantum annealer. And physically, we make these problems hard by the following property. So um, each of these uh, energy functions here, or the Hamiltonian that we present, that we use to represent this problem, have a unique ground state. Of course, the ground state when the expression evaluates to true, and a highly degenerate first excited state. This means that there are many low energy solutions, uh, which are not solutions to the original problem, but they are slightly above zero. And if there are a lot of them, then during the quantum annealing process, the annealer might easily jump into one of these higher energy solutions, so these excited states. And that is what makes them uh, motivated by physical principles, makes them very hard to solve on the quantum annealers. So here is the success rate for 1,000 two-sub problems. In particular, we have roughly half of all the problems uh, for which a direct embedding so uh, a direct mapping onto the chimera topology could be found. And almost all of the problems could be directly mapped onto the Pegasus topology of, of the new system, but uh, not all of them. Some of them needed an embedding. And here are some results. So uh, for all of these problems, we plot the success rate on the old system versus the success rate on the new system. And if a point is in this upper triangle here, um, then we know that the new system performed better. And okay, as you see, almost all of the problems could achieve higher success rates on the new system. And in particular, those problems which have a direct mapping could achieve higher success rates on the new system. Um, the largest enhancement, by the way, was for those problems which have no direct mapping on Chimera. So they need an embedding here, but they did have a direct mapping on the pegos. But this is, of course, obvious because if you don't need an embedding, then you can map each problem variable to one qubit and you only use the native connections. You don't need to have the virtual connections that you have in an embedding uh, with the chain strings. So um, this showed the improvement due to the increased connectivity on the Pegasus topology. So, okay, uh, we also looked at two particular two sub problems to see if we can find the same effect that we found for the tail assignment problems, namely that if the problem is rather simple or, or easy, um, if then the, the old system does a better job. And this we see here. So first we took a very hard problem. Um, as expected, the new system performs better, but for a very easy problem, um, we see that indeed the old system scored better success rates. So uh, we can interpret this as uh, the old system has, of course, also matured over time and engineering 
has improved over time on the old system and the new system, which has a very complicated connectivity also probably needs some more uh, engineering, some more development to get the same uh, measure of stability that we could find in the old system. And the last um, uh, exercise we did on the two sub problems is called multiple copy problem. And here we embed multiple copies of the same problem on different parts of the machine. So this looks like this. Here we have um, all of, uh, for example, here's one problem and the same problem embedded on another part of the machine is here and here and so on. And the goal is that uh, with this scheme, we can solve multiple problems at the same time. So we use less resources, but since they are all the same problems, uh, we can also test the, the capacity of the machine by using the full machine and not just part of the machine. And this allows us to check whether different parts of the machine, since they all solve the same problem, work independently, or if there are parts of the machine that perform better than other parts of the machine. Okay, so these problems uh, using the multiple copy version have a logical qubits between 180 and 900, and the results are here. So here we count for each uh, part for each separate problem on the machine, um, which of these uh, problems yielded the ground state. And uh, the ground state meaning the solution to the original two sub problem. And for example, for 10 copies, that's the red dots here, we found that um, very often uh, three of the 10 problems were solved simultaneously and um, never 10 of those problems. So what does this allow us to conclude? Um, first, we see that this distribution follows a binomial distribution. And this would be the distribution that we would expect given the hypothesis that these parts are actually independent. So if each of these problems has a certain probability P to find the ground state, then if we put the same problem on different parts, it's a simple counting exercise to see, uh, to get the probability for having one or two or three or four solutions. So for 10 copies, given a certain number of, of, of uh, parts that yield a solution, we can use the binomial distribution if they were all independent and had the same probability to count the number of occurrences that we would expect. And the fact that they all follow this distribution is sort of the positive hypothesis test that these parts actually work independently of each other. So um, importantly also, what I just said, that um, in no case we could find uh, all of the ground states. And the reason is, of course, that as soon as you have a probability for like 23% to find a solution, if you put 10 of these problems uh, at the same time on the machine, then the probability will be very low that all of these 10 copies are in the case where only 20, with 23% they yield a solution. So that's, uh, in a sense, that's, that's expected, right? As soon as you have a probability that is not exactly one, if you put many copies on the system, it's almost certain that none of, uh, that never will you find all of those copies uh, yielding a solution at the same time. Okay, so, Let's go to the very last application that I uh, want to present. And these are the uh, quantum support vector machines. Um, oh, actually this, uh, this year is wrong, this should be 2019, okay. So a support vector machine is a supervised machine learning method that you probably well know, and it's often used for binary classification. So um, binary classification, as we see in this uh, image here, would be, for example, on a 2D, a coordinate system to separate all the blue points from the red points. So the task would be to find this decision boundary between the blue and the red points. So this is toy model data, of course, but it, it visualizes the, um, the task very well. And uh, formally, if we are given a training set with a certain uh, feature vector of, uh, of, of several dimensions can also be very large, right? In this case, the feature vector is only two dimensional and a certain number of labels, which would be plus or minus one, maybe plus one for the blue and minus one for the red points. And then we're given N of these uh, data points as our training set. Now the task is 
to train a classifier on these uh, on this training data to classify uh, unseen data uh, for the future so to, to test them against the test set and to do a support vector machine to find these classifiers we have to solve a quadratic programming problem so here is the dual formulation of a support vector machine and the problem variables are these alpha so uh, in the derivation these alphas are Lagrange multipliers but um, the important thing is that if we have all the alphas basically we have this decision boundary between the two classes and we see that in this uh, formulation the alphas occur quadratically and linearly so this already has some resemblance to the Kubo formalism uh, that we need to put them into in order to solve them on the D-wave. Furthermore, they are also bounded between zero and some constant C. But um, the important point now is that these problem variables are continuous. And if we want to use a quantum nila to solve this problem, uh, oh, I forgot to say that uh, the kernel is nonlinear. That's why we don't have a linear decision one. But okay, if we want to solve this problem on a quantum annealer, we only have binary problem variables. So we somehow need to convert these continuous problem variables into binary variables that we can use the qubits for. And we do this by choosing a certain encoding. And this encoding is very similar to a standard um, IEEE 754 floating point encoding that we have on our everyday computers. And um, formally, it looks like this. So we have a certain number of bits. So these are the binary variables. And then we add up, given a certain base and an exponent, several contributions. And we use for each continuous problem variable k of these binary variables. Um, in principle, if we chose the base two, uh, we would end up with a floating point encoding, like, like standard floating point encoding. But it's also, it, it, uh, it, it may be helpful because we know that each of these problem variables is between zero and C um, to choose this base and the exponent differently. Also because we typically are still limited in the number of qubits so that we don't need uh, like 64 bits to represent one continuous problem variable as we would on, on a digital computer. All right, if we use this encoding and we insert this alpha into the original energy function, we immediately get a quadratic expression that we then can use as a Kubo formulation for the problem. And this now looks a little bit differently to the Kubo form that I showed before. Uh, I put this here because uh, in the paper, we also have this formulation, but it's of course equivalent because um, if uh, on the diagonal of this Q matrix, the Kubo matrix um, is a number, then we have Xi squared. And because Xi is Boolean variable, uh, it's the same as xi. So we get the linear terms by putting numbers on the diagonal of this Kubo matrix. Okay, first we apply this technique to toy model data. And for each of them, we visualize the classifiers that we get from the solution of the training. So when we solve the problem, either classically using the classical support vector machine or using a certain sample of bit strings for the x's from the D wave, we compute these alphas and they represent the solution so that we can compute this decision function. And uh, the classical SVM um, resulted in this uh, decision boundary. So that is uh, the global minimum. Uh, of course, the uh, principal support vector machine can be solved by convex programming. So we know that it's the global minimum, but only for the training data. And the thing is, we don't know if the global minimum for the training data um, generalizes as well to unseen test data as, uh, as another solution. And this is the point where we saw uh, that we might have um, uh, an advantage from using a quantum annealer because a quantum annealer always gives all of uh, 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 the set of solutions, so an ensemble of also higher energy solutions at the same time. And if we visualize these here, we see that, of course, the lowest energy solution was the global minimum, but also slightly higher energy solutions that, in principle, we, we get for free also classify the data correctly. And maybe a combination of these classifiers from the slightly higher energy solutions uh, that you sort of get for free might generalize better to unseen data than the single global minimum. So we applied this to um, a computational biology experiment. 
And here the task was to classify whether a certain protein called transcription factor binds to DNA or not. So this is a, a binary classification problem uh, with the data, of course, um, given in, in, uh, in the form. So, so we, 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 of course, didn't make the data ourselves, but we got them from a computational biology lab. But um, this classification problem can then be solved on a quantum annealer using the same QSVM formulation that I just introduced. And here are some results. So here we measure success in terms of uh, the area under the receiver operating curve or the area under the precision recall curve. But these are basically um, slightly more sophisticated measures only to measure success um, slightly better than using only the accuracy because it's independent of the bias in the decision function. So the, the area that you see here is a measure for success of the classifier in a sense. And we see that the classical, uh, the global minimum for the training data does not have a very optimal shape in the precision recall curve. And solution number 14, for example, from the ensemble that we got from the quantum annealer has a very good shape here. So the idea was then to combine all these classifiers, the lowest 20 energies, um, to see if they generalize better to the unseen data or not. Our observations here were that uh, we get this ensemble of solutions at one shot from the programming perspective. And indeed, the classifier did generalize better to the unseen data, but the problem size was still small. So we could only, um, so we had to train a lot of. Uh, small classifiers for sub for parts of the data and also combine them to uh, really compete with a classical support vector machine. Of course, we also did that uh, procedure then for the classical support vector machine to have a fair comparison. Okay, uh, and the last application that I want to talk about is remote sensing. And here the task is to uh, classify whether a certain from satellite images, whether a certain part of the image is a river, for example, a beach, um, grass, a forest, or a house. And we, uh, this is not just RGB data, right? So in this case, there's also some infrared or UV uh, reflectance. And so it, it's more than three dimensional. So it's not, not simple image recognition in that sense. But uh, here are some results. So here's a false color image of a street and houses. And the ground truth says that uh, all the houses uh, should be classified as one class and the street and the surrounding area as the other class. Uh, we trained the classical SVM uh, with the result being shown here and the quantum SVM using the same techni techniques as, as before. And in principle, the classifier turned out to be slightly better than the classical SVM. And for the future, uh, so this is not my work anymore, but um, this uh, other people also from the group are, are involved here. Um, they try to extend this to multi-class classification. So not only uh, binary classes like house or not house, but also maybe um, water or some factory or, or something else. All right. Um, so summarizing what I've shown, um, first we looked at these garden optimization problems and uh, tail assignment problems for airline scheduling, where in both cases we saw that the embedding is very important and also the chain strength that we choose is very important to, to get a successful solution, at least if we use the bare quantum processor and not the hybrid uh, solver offered by D-Wave systems. And then we looked at two satisfiability where we saw that um, different parts of the machine indeed behaved independently. We used a specific uh, set of problems that is very hard or was engineered to be very hard for quantum annealers. Um, like for benchmarking purposes. And finally, we looked at the quantum support vector machines with applications for toy model data, uh, computation biology, and remote sensing. And um, our main observations here were that uh, on these quantum annealers, the first thing we have to do when we want to solve something on them is to formulate it as a cubo problem or equivalently an easing problem. So we have to put this into such a formulation. There are certain tricks. We've seen some, for example, how to put constraints into the problem, but there are also other tricks. So there's a, a whole bunch of heuristics in the meantime to formulate problems in this, uh, in this formulation. And always when we solve this problem, we get an ensemble of solutions, at least if we use the bare quantum processor, uh, of which not all are the global minimum, 
maybe even none of them are the global minimum, but all of them are low energy solutions. And for some applications, low energy solutions are probably just well enough if they come uh, faster or um, at a lower price, uh, or simply because you can combine them as we did for the QSVMs to find a better classifier. And um, then the third point uh, is that these systems have a very low energy consumption, which is of course relevant for us as a supercomputing center, uh, where we have the supercomputers that have very high energy consumption. So in combination, maybe we might also benefit there. But the limitations, the main limitations that we saw was that large problems, um, still because they are still quite young, quite, quite early technology, right? Or problems with embeddings with long chains. So it's good to, to keep in mind, may be problematic. So uh, sometimes you might uh, not get the global minimum, for example, or you might not even uh, get a bunch of very low energy solutions. But um, with these things in mind, it's in principle possible to overcome these problems. So what we see as a future model of computation would be a, a hybrid quantum classical model where parts of some problem are solved on the quantum annealer. And um, maybe the subdivision into separate problems is done by classical or by supercomputer or also by, by GPU or something like that. All right, uh, with that, I uh, would like to thank you for your attention and close the talk. Thank you very much for that, this insightful talk. And we have time for questions. If you have a question, please raise a hand in the chat. Um, and meanwhile, maybe I can start with the first question regarding the uh, differences in the um, annealing time. Have you observed like typically the annealing time is 20 microseconds, which, and it can go up to 100 microseconds. So in which cases it actually makes sense to, to choose the annealing time differently than 20 microseconds, which is the default value? Um, yes, uh, indeed. I, I, I previously actually had, had a slide for that, but uh, I think I, uh, I dropped it <laughs> for the interest of time. But okay, so uh, yeah, indeed. The, the annealing time is this important measure um, next to the chain strength that we can use to tune the solution. And I would always suggest also to do that because especially for uh, harder problems, for example, um, maybe I can go to some of the tail assignment results um, where we had these. Ah, okay, that was on slide. Uh, let me go back just a second. Uh, here. So here we had the result that using the, this was the default annealing time with 20 microseconds, that uh, some of the embeddings had 50% success, but not as high as they had here. And then from this uh, uh, exercise, we knew what embeddings were good and what chain strength was good. So we took the um, result with the best uh, embedding and the best chain strength, and then scale the annealing time. And then you see that if you go down to one microsecond, then this point in success rate drops down to here. And if you go to 2000 microseconds, which is the maximum, it goes uh, up to here. And I would suggest to try logarithmically spaced annealing times because that's physically motivated. So use uh, equally spaced and um, logarithmically spaced um, annealing times between one and 2000 microseconds. And if you have a very low success rate, then it, it might help to increase the annealing time. Uh, however, what one can also see that we did this for this result here, for example, which has like a 90% success rate. If you then increase the annealing time, the results might go down. Um, probably not to zero, but this is also, this can also be physically explained because these systems uh, are quantum systems, they are very fragile. And um, even though the temperature on these systems is very close to zero, it's not exactly zero. So there is an environment, there's some thermal interaction with uh, environments and, and some currents and magnetic fields flowing around. And also cosmic, just, uh, cosmic radiation. <laughs> so yeah, probably also cosmic radiation or, or whatever, whatever kind of disturbance there may be. Um, but they might, uh, might trip the system so that it jumps from the ground state into a lower energy state, which is not the global minimum anymore. And the longer you wait, so the longer you anneal, the higher the chance for the system to jump out of, uh, out of the state. So, but roughly I'd say the 20 microseconds default value is good to start with. And first try several embeddings and chain strengths. 
And only then, if you still have very low success rate, take the best embedding and the best chain string and then scale the annealing time. And you can, of course, calibrate these parameters uh, if you have it in a machine, machine learning uh, sense with training and test. You can calibrate them for the training and then use these values for the testing too. All right. Uh, yes. And my second question was regarding the Lagrange multipliers. Uh, mm -hmm. Like many constraints can be formulated in the unconstrained formulation using the AX minus B formulation, right? Uh, and from your experience, um, like, can it happen or have you observed for some problems that adding those constraints or adding multiple of such Lagrange multipliers results in the fact that the, the system cannot find an optimal solution even after 1000 uh, samples or like basically the probability drops so dramatically that no global solution can be obtained at all? Uh, yes, in principle, that, that can happen. And that, that can easily happen if you have a lot of constraints then there may be a very uh, small um, range of, Lagrange, or of values that you choose for these Lagrange multipliers, which um, balances the constraints and, and the cost function uh, correctly. And, and this is also something that one probably should examine beforehand, because in principle, we can compute the energy scales of these terms and then choose a Lagrange multiplier which balances them correctly. In principle, I mean mathematically, of course, we could just take them arbitrarily high so in, in this case, actually, it's, it's on the wrong part, right? We would put the Lagrange multiplier on the constraint and not on the cost function. In this case, it's only one, so it doesn't matter. But if it was here, we would put it arbitrarily high in theory so that the constraint is always satisfied and uh, then only the minimum here is found. But on the system, of course, it matters. So we, we cannot put them to in infinity, right? Because uh, these magnetic fields do have a range. And if, if, if the problem, if the magnetic fields are rescaled to fit into the range of the problems, then this would become negligible. So um, for the garden problem where we had most of the Lagrange multipliers, uh, actually three of them, um, it turned out that a good solution was simply to, go to, to set them all to one. Mm -hmm. um, we tried different values, of course, but it seems that the scales of these four different terms are all very well comparable so that putting them to one uh, yields a good um, compromise, yes. Right. Thank you. And another question for the page um, 26 regarding the alpha parameters in the support vector machines. Okay, let me go to page 26. Um, here, yes. All right. So once again, for understanding, um, the alphas are floating point values right right and they they encode the so to say they parameterize the the decision boundary or um in principle they so when when we derive the dual formulation of the svm they are also lagrange multipliers but if we have them we can find the solution to the original primary problem um, and this formula is uh, given here so if we have all the alphas we can compute the decision function according to this formula. So given a certain data point, um, we sum over all the values of all the training data, and we have an alpha for this, and um, the given label of the training data, and then take the kernel function with the certain training data point. Oh, I see. So this is the way to parameterize the decision boundary. So by applying this formula, right? Right, right. And, mm -hmm. and this is exactly so this uh, f equal to zero is this boundary. And uh, F negative, I think in this case would be inside and F positive would be outside. So this is the sign of this function is the decision then. Right, right, correct. Right, and maybe last question from my side on the one of the last pages, I think page number 32. So where you have mentioned about that the solutions obtained by D-Wave are so-called one-shot solutions. So the, the, the ensemble of solutions is obtained at one shot or a solution basically obtained at one shot. So also have you considered for some problems to design an algorithm in such a way that it uh, performs a sequence of CPU, QPU computations and then arrives at the optimal solution with high probability? Like basically, okay, this is the input data, the first cube, but the cube is solved, it goes back, the new Using this result, the new cubo is constructed, it's solved, and so on until convergence, or according to some convergence criterion. 
Yeah, and in principle, this can be done. Um, there is, for example, a technique called a spin reversal transformation mm -hmm. and uh, also reverse annealing, <clears throat> where uh, the D Wave uh, software offers some going back and forth and um, all the way. So it's like really reverse annealing. So we also go through the annealing functions back and forth and adjusting parameters on the way to find at an optimal solution. Um, so, but we uh, ourselves have not done this. So we, when we use the bare cube use, uh, always try to formulate the problem in this way and then submit it to the machine with say a thousand or 10,000 reads. So we get these 10,000 solutions at one shot. And then we look at the distribution also maybe to learn, uh, to learn about the distribution, right? Whether they are thermally distributed or according to some Boltzmann, uh, some, some or some quantum distribution or whatever. And um, in a sense, when we use the hybrid solvers, then we also, I think they internally also use some uh, going back and forth and then stitching together parts of the solution. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the hybrid solvers, we don't have any details on how they are implemented. So that would rather be something that one could try um, on, it, on their own, like trying. Right. So this do. is this might be one of the actually issues when doing research with hybrid solvers, because actually we don't know what goes behind the scenes. It's very difficult to analyze, to make any scientific conclusions based, based exactly, on this result. Exactly. So that's why we also don't focus on them. So we did include them in the benchmark for the garden optimization problems. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, to understand what's going on and also to benchmark the progress, I guess it's it's better to really look at the, at the real machine because there at least we can see uh, what is going on and we can control it. So also for, for scientific reasons, right? Right, right. All right. Um, any further questions? And we have a, a question by Marcel. Yes, please. Um, have you considered to do some spectral gap uh, calculations to design other annealing paths? Um, Partly. So uh, as far as I know, so, uh, this was not my work, but uh, on the two sub problems, we have uh, one PhD student and one postdoc who work very strongly on, on also looking at the spectra. So um, there we uh, really try to diagonalize the spectra uh, through the annealing process, which is a difficult task if you have already like 20 or 30 qubits, because then you, you need already a lot of memory on the supercomputers to do this. Uh, so that, but then you can really see that uh, if you have the spectrum during the annealing, at what point in the annealing, maybe the system jumps to a higher energy state and um, how close these, these uh, so this is very, very information because you see how close the energy levels evolve over time when the system starts in the initial state and goes into the final state. And um, then also for the spectral gap, uh, this is basically, so often people uh, mean the spectral gap only at the end of the annealing process. So the difference between the ground state and the first excited state and energy, this is also very important, right? But um, if you really want to see what's going on, I think one really has to look at the gap also during the annealing. Because at the entire state, function, yeah. Right, right. Some states might cross and so on. But, um, but okay, I, I don't know uh, on how much they have tried to um, uh, design specific annealing uh, schedules. In principle, the, the software allows to, uh, to, to design your own annealing schedule, right? But we have uh, always tried linear annealing schedules and um, so in theory, and then the D-wave annealing schedule in practice and some simulations also with a D-wave annealing schedule, um, but designing any, uh, okay, maybe, maybe we had a master student once, but okay, this is not, this is not my part of, of the group. So uh, thank you. Yeah, just to follow up on that, on the page 21, you've been talking about designing a problem in such a way that it's easy for classical computer, but very difficult for quantum computer, right? So I think also there, to put it in other words, this problem has been designed in such a way that the spectral gap was as small as possible. So the difference between the lowest, uh, like the globally optimal solution and the second lowest energy solution. Uh, yes, exactly. And, and here, uh... Uh, as far as I know, um, the, here the spectral gap is chosen to be small um, at the end of the process, mm -hmm. but we also examine the spectral gap during the annealing process. So if I recall, uh, Rinda from our group um, in, in, her, in her work presented that um, uh, very important sometimes is also the gap during the annealing process, because if this minimum gap during the annealing process is really uh, small, then at this point in time, the system will for sure jump into the higher state. Right. And then even if the gap uh, widens so that at the end, 
which you can simply calculate here. At the end, it's large. It might have been uh, small uh, during exactly the as as the sum, so to say, in the sum. Right. Right. Like. Um, but in principle, to find the gaps during kneeling, you would have to solve uh, the eigenvalue problems uh, mm -hmm. for all times and this is for all time steps. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. If there are no more questions, then we can close for today. Thank you very much for this exciting talk. Um, no and yeah, that's it for today. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.